So what we've done is we've taken a quick look at the scholastic approach to the historical narratives in Islam. We've, we took a look at the way they're approached by skeptical scholars, by scholars who are uh, working with uh, critical viewpoints. And then we applied that to Muhammad. Now what we're going to do is we're going to basically apply that to the Quran. We're going to take a look at the Quran, at its nature, um, and how it was put together. Uh, yesterday I did not actually get to cover the way Muslims see the Quran, the way they see it as having been compiled, so we'll do that now. If you were to talk to a Muslim who's familiar with the way the Quran has been brought together, has been compiled, here's what they will say. They will say Muhammad received oral dicta uh, they received orally dictated to him through Gabriel the Quran. So Gabriel would come, recite it to Muhammad, Muhammad would receive it, and he would then dictate it to scribes. So scribes, amanuenses, whatever you want to call them, would write down whatever Muhammad said. This they would write down on either stalks of palm leaf or um, on bones or stones or what have you. They would write down these verses however they could. Uh, and then when Muhammad died, Abu Bakr, the next Khalifa, uh, or the next, his successor, the first Caliph, the first Khalifa, he ordered all of these within the first two years of his caliphate to be collected. Um, all these stocks, these stones, these bones, what have you. And also, he had Muslims recite these Quranic verses from memory to verify the sources, and all of the Quran was then compiled in the form of a book. So during Muhammad's life, you had it all written down in various places, you had it memorized by people, and then when Muhammad died, the next caliph came, consolidated, consolidated it into a book. However, that Khalifa Abu Bakr did not spread the book. Uh, he just had it written down. It wasn't until about 17 years after Muhammad when Uthman, the third caliph, the third successor uh, of Muhammad, he received complaints from Muslims all around the Islamic empire who were disagreeing about the Quran. At this point, Uthman ordered for that book that Abu Bakr had compiled to be brought back and for people to come back and for all the manuscripts that people had in their possession to be brought back. Um, from that book, a committee was put together, led by an, a man named Zayd ibn Thabit. Zayd is an important name, Z-A-I-D. Ibn, I-B-N, and Thabit, T-H-A-B-I-T. Zayd ibn Thabit um, comes together and puts a committee and look, takes a look at the book that was compiled under Abu Bakr modifies it, writes it according to the dialect of the Quraysh, uh, the people in Mecca, and then he takes all the other sources, everything that was out there, all the other writings, everything, and he burns them, he destroys them. He makes five copies of the book that he made and sends them out to the various Islamic provinces. Now that's the general contour of the compilation of the Quran that most Muslims will agree to. Um, there are some differences that some people have, for example, was it Umar, was it Uthman who first decided to make one final version? Um, was it five books at the end? Was it seven? Was it three? Where were they sent out to, etc. But generally speaking, that contour is accepted by most Muslims. Any questions on the Islamic view? And yes, you heard me right. Uh, they do think that all the sources of the Quran before Uthman were burnt and destroyed. Um, and just those five remained. I was just going to ask that about Abdullah bin Masood, if they believe that his stuff... We'll be talking about that. It's a good question. So what we're going to look at then is we're going to juxtapose that basic understanding of the Quran with a more critical approach to the Quran. Uh, for those of you who might wonder, uh, most of what I just gave you, the view of how the Quran was brought together, is found in Sahih Bukhari, book number 61. Uh, book number 61 is about, about the collection of the Qur'an, for the most part. So when we take a look at the Qur'an here, uh, what we're going to be talking about first is the societal context. What was Arabia like at the time when the Qur'an was being composed? Early history, we're going to take a look at these two interesting points here, the Ahruf and abrogation. Then we're going to talk about early disputes of the Quran. We're going to talk about Ibn Mujahid uh, and the Qiraat. You'll learn about what the Qiraat are. 
And then finally, we're going to end with today's Quran and then a look at the Quran as an oral text. So this is what we're about to cover. Uh, before I delve into this, I just remembered someone had asked me to talk a little bit more about the Satanic verses. Um, do you mind if we do that real quick yeah. before going forward? Um, so the Satanic verses, as we had mentioned earlier, uh, are verses where Muhammad talked about you can uh, accept Allah al Uzza and al Manat as the exalted cranes. Here's how they read. Have ye thought upon Allah al Uzza and Manat, the third, the other? These are the exalted Gharanik, whose intercession is hoped for. Gharanik being translated cranes. The verse I told you where Allah said, don't worry, this has happened to prophets before you, uh, that is still in the Quran. That's chapter 22 of the Quran, verse 52. It says, never sent we a messenger or prophet before you, but when he recited, Satan proposed in respect of that which he recited thereof. In other words, whenever that prophet would say something from me, Satan would try to throw something in there. But Allah abolishes that which Satan proposes. Then Allah establishes his revelation. Allah is the all-knowing, the wise. So this verse in the Quran comforts Muhammad saying, don't worry, this has happened to you before, I'll take care of it. And then we have a modified version of what Muhammad originally said, still found in the Quran. It's found in chapter 53, verse 21. 53, 21. It says, have you thought about Allah al-Uzza and Manat, the third, the other? Are yours the males and his the females? That indeed were an unfair division. They are but names which ye have named, ye and your fathers, for what Allah hath revealed no warrant. They follow but a guess that which they themselves desire. And now the guidance from their Lord has come unto them. So you can see this, this is the stuff that's still found in the Quran, um, but read Shahab Ahmed's dissertation to get more on that. Okay, back to the Quran. Let's look at the social context in which the Quran was written. I briefly mentioned yesterday, we're gonna go into a little bit more detail right now, uh, that the Quran was written at a time when the script had not been fully developed. It was still in its formative phases in the 6th century and the 7th century. The first, Islamic, uh, the first Arabic inscription, so what we're talking about is the language, uh, Arabic, uh, it was written in other scripts before it had its own script. So it was written in Nabataean scripts, for example. It wasn't until the 4th or 5th century when the first script we have uh, is dated. Uh, it's called the Qariyat al fal I don't know how interested you are in this, but um, <laughs> Qariyat al fal Q-A-R-Y-A-T-A-L-F-A-W, Qariyat al fal It's the first Arabic inscription that we have, and it is just that, it's an inscription. Uh, it's not a whole book, it's, it's not much, it's, uh, I believe it is a uh, kind of a eulogy for one's brother, it's found on a tomb. You do not have clear Arabic here. You still have Nabataean influences. In the fifth century, you get, three, um, you get three Arabic inscriptions, which are a little bit more Arabic in nature. Uh, by the time the sixth century comes around, uh, you're just beginning to get these Arabic writings. It's interesting to note, by the time the Quran comes, there is no literature in Arabic, none. There are no literary works at all. Uh, you do have poems, and you do have things that are called books, but they're not written, they're spoken, they're oral, and they're passed down orally. Um, the, there was no prose per se, as we would understand it. There was plenty of oral poetry, but it was not written. And this is understood. By the time er uh, the Quran comes around, you still have a script that is very defective. It mm -hmm. cannot capture the entirety of the Arabic language. And in fact, that's what it's called in scholastic treatments. It's called the scriptum defectivum. It just simply could not capture Arabic. Here's a look at some of the earliest Qurans that we have. This script is called Kufic script. If you compare it with the modern Quran, you'll see that the letters are all disconnected. There's, there's not much connection between the letters. These red dots that you see are added later. These red dots, these are added later. These were not part of the original uh, script. Those are called nukat, and they're extremely important, because check it out, some of these letters look very similar to one another. Uh, some of these letters, 
You can't quite tell what they are unless they have a dot to distinguish it from other letters. Um, so for example, you can't really tell the difference between a, a fa and a goth. Uh, you would have to have some kind of parallel oral tradition in, able to, in order to be able to read this. Uh, that is one of the first types of script. Here's another early type of script. This is called the Hijazi script. Uh, it's just not able to capture a lot that Arabic has uh, for not just the nukat, but also uh, the vocalics. If you read Arabic today, you'll see that there are lines above and below some of the letters, and it tells you how to translate or how to read some of these letters. They did not exist at this time because the script had not been codified, uh, the methods hadn't been invented and implemented universally. So what you had then was early on, these were used basically as reminders for an oral text. Um, this was used uh, to, to basically remind people what ought to be read. This itself was not considered the Quran. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. At the very least, we can say that the scriptum defectivum at the time did not allow for fully capturing the Quran. The first revelation of the Quran was 610 AD, and the last revelation of the Quran was 623, uh, I got that backwards, 632 AD. And as we said, this is the term that's used often for the Quran uh, in, scholastic, in scholarly literature. They'll call them AIDS memoirs. These were mnemonic aids to help you remember what you learned of the text orally. An interesting fact about the Quran is that according to the Islamic sources, Muhammad considered the Quran fluid in a sense. You could read certain verses in multiple ways. This is called a harf, or in plural, it's called ahruf, which you see up top there. Here's a hadith about the ahruf. Jibril, or the angel Gabriel, recited the Quran to me in one way. Then I requested him to recite it in another, and continued asking him to recite it in other ways. And he recited it several ways, until ultimately he recited it in seven different ways. You might be asking, what in the world is going on? <laughs> and in fact, a lot of Muslim scholars still ask that question. They really don't know what the ahruf are. But here's another hadith which might shed some light. Umar ibn al-Khattab, now this is the second caliph, this is the second successor. Most Muslims say he's guided by God. Umar ibn al-Khattab narrated, I was sitting in the masjid when I heard Hisham ibn Hakim recite Surah al-Furqan. I was almost about to jump on him in his prayer, but I waited until he finished. Umar is known to be very hot-blooded, by the way. <laughs> and then he grabbed him and then grabbed him by his garment and asked him, who taught you to recite in this manner? He replied, it was the prophet himself. I responded, you are mistaken, for indeed I learned this surah from the prophet, and it was different from your recitation. Therefore I, Omar, dragged him to the prophet and complained to him that Hisham had been reciting surah al furqan in a manner different from what Muhammad had taught me. At this, the Prophet told me to let go of Hisham and asked him to recite Surah al furqan Hisham recited the Surah in the same way that I had heard him recite before. When he finished, the Prophet said, it was revealed in this way. So Muhammad affirms how Hisham was reading it. He then asked me to recite the Surah. When I had finished, Muhammad said, it was also revealed in this way. The Quran has been revealed in seven different ahruf, so recite whichever one is easy for you. So this sheds some light on the differences between each harf. It was enough for Umar to get furious at someone. So it's not small, it's different enough for Umar to get furious and to consider interrupting someone's prayer. At the same time, Muhammad considers it a legitimate alternative method for reciting a hadith. Volume 3, book six, uh, number 601. Here's another one. Uh, by the way, that, that other one, that other hadith was found in Sahih Bukhari. So really, really strong hadith. And there's many of them in Sahih Bukhari. 
Uh, you can even find more of these. That book that I told you, book number 61 uh, in Sahih Bukhari, volume six, book 61, extremely important. You'll find some of these in there. This hadith, I've had trouble tracing it to uh, an original source, a primary source, but I've seen it quoted in multiple second sources. This source, uh, where I got this from, was from an imam named uh, Ayatollah Khui. He is Shia, uh, and he's using it polemically against Sunni Muslims, so take it with a grain of salt. According to this hadith, it says, the messenger of God used to dictate to him Samiun Alim or Azizun Hakim or something to that effect. If you, by the way, if you get familiar with the Quran, you'll see that at the end of various verses it says, and God is all knowing and wise, or God is the beneficent and the merciful. It just ends with these epithets for God. Here it's saying that the messenger of God used to dictate Samiun Alim or Azizun Hakim, these are various epithets, or something to that effect, used as a verse ending. The man would sometimes inquire, speaking of, speaking of a scribe, the man would sometimes inquire from the messenger of God saying, is it Azizun Hakim or Samiyun Alim or Azizun Alim? In other words, what was the ending you just said? Which one should I use? And the messenger would say to him, whichever you write is all right. In other words, go ahead and write whatever you want. The sources, by the way, are condemning this man uh, for being infatuated with the fact that he could choose the words of the Quran. Uh, this man would then go around boasting, I am able to write verses of the Quran um, and the sources are condemning him. But it gives us a little bit more insight into the Ahruf. It's, there's variability in, in some of these endings here. There's variability, which is okay. There's some fluidity here in this text. Um, and that draws an important distinction to what a lot of Muslims claim about the Quran. When they say that it is, even at this day, exactly as it always was, well, what does that mean? What does that even mean when there was this degree of fluidity in the text? We'll revisit that soon. So those are the Ahruf. Um, like I said, Muslim scholars have been wrestling with the Ahruf ever since Muhammad's time, and they've come up with various explanations. Some other people say that the Ahruf are synonyms. In other words, you can recite one word for another word as long as it means the same thing. And this is found in Hadith as well. There are various Hadith which say, as long as you don't replace justice with mercy or mercy with justice, say whatever you'd like. And Muhammad says that of the Quran. There's lots of Hadith that say that. This is found so deeply in the Hadith that people are not able to throw them out. Um, Shia tried to, uh, but Sunnis don't throw them out. Uh, there was one Sunni scholar who spent over 30 years of his life trying to figure out what the Ahruf are. And by the time he was done, he still wasn't sure. So very, very interesting. There is another phenomenon in the Quran which cause, uh, accounts for a lot of interesting difficulties when we talk about the original text, and that is abrogation in the Quran, the doctrine of abrogation. We introduced it yesterday. Here's what it says in chapter 2, verse 106 of the Quran. None of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something better or similar. Knowest thou not that God hath power over all, God hath power over all things? Chapter 16, verse 101 has a similar statement. And how this has been used classically in Islam is to say that Allah revealed certain verses and then he replaced them with other verses. Muslim scholars, uh, traditionalists, have taken these verses and have tried to categorize them. And they will say there are three different types of abrogation. The first type is abrogation of both verse and command. In other words, there was something that was part of the Quran, and now the verse is gone, and the command is no longer uh, imputed to Muslims. That's one type. Another type of abrogation is abrogation of verse, but not command. The verse is not found in the Quran, but the command still applies to Muslims. And the third type is abrogation of command, but not verse. The verse is still in the Quran, but you don't have to follow it anymore. These are three separate types of abrogations that Muslim scholars have uh, come up with. They're not, I mean, that's not laid out in any of the Hadith or in the Quran itself. It's something that they've extrapolated from the Hadith and the Quran. What is interesting uh, here is the idea that there were verses in the Quran that are no longer in the Quran. So we're not worried about that third type of abrogation. 
where the command no longer applies, but the verse is still found. Theologically, that's interesting, but when we're talking about the Quran and its composition, what matters to us is verses which were at one point part of the Quran, which are no longer a part of the Quran. Let's take a look at an example. This is found in Sahih Muslim, number 2286. It's a long one. Abu Harb bin Abu al-Aswad reported on the authority of his father that Abu Musa al-Ashari sent for the reciters of Basra. They came to him and they were 300 in number. So these are 300 people who recite the Quran. They teach the reciting of the Quran. They recited the Quran and he said, you are the best amongst the inhabitants of Basra for you are the reciters among them. So good on you for reciting the Quran. You're the best of the people there because that's what you do. So continue reciting it, but bear in mind that your reciting for a long time may not harden your hearts as were hardened the hearts of those before you. We used to recite a surah, so now he's saying don't make the same mistake we did. We used to recite a surah which resembled in length and severity surah barat. I have however forgotten it with the exception of this which I remember out of it. If there were two valleys full of riches for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley and nothing would fill the stomach of the son of Adam but dust. Well, this verse isn't found anywhere in the Quran. So what this man is saying is there's a surah that used to be as long as a surah barat, which is a long surah. And he forgot it, and what he remembers out of it is not found in the Quran anymore. And we used to recite another, so now he's talking about another surah. And we used to recite a surah which resembled one of the surahs of Musabbihat. And I have forgotten it but remember this much out of it. O people who believe, why do you say that which you do not practice? And that is recorded in your necks as a witness against you, and you would be asked about it on the day of resurrection. Two chapters, according to this hadith, from Sahih Muslim, an important compilation. Two chapters of the Quran which are not found in the Quran today. And he's saying they are long chapters. Bukhari gives us some more. Book 82, number 817. Allah sent Muhammad with the truth and revealed the holy book to him. And among what Allah revealed was the verse of Rajam, which is the verse of stoning a married person who commits illegal sexual intercourse. And we did recite this verse and understood it and memorized it. And Allah's apostle did carry out the punishment of stoning. And so did we after him. Well, guess what? The verse of stoning is not found in the Quran anymore. Omar is recorded as having said, again, this is Omar, hot blooded Omar. He's recorded as having said, as a caliph, as a khalifa, he said, if I could write down this verse into the Quran with my own hand, I would, if people wouldn't accuse me of having altered the word of God. Omar was so certain that this verse should be part of the Quran that he would have written it in had he not run the risk of being condemned for altering the word of Allah. There's a lot more on this abrogation, by the way. If you have a Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran, all you have to do is go to chapter 33, verse 6. And in the footnotes, it will say, Ubay had a different set of words that he used. Say Bukhari, uh, by the way, Ubay ibn Kaab, which, which Yusuf Ali is referring there, uh, he was listed by Muhammad as one of, the, one of the four best teachers of the Quran. So here you have a man, Muhammad has said, if you're going to learn the Quran, learn it from one of these four. That man recited words in his Quran, which are not in the Quran today. Sahih Bukhari refers to him and says explicitly that Ubay ibn Kaab recites portions of the Quran that we do not recite, and he will not leave it for anything whatsoever. So he's certain that there are words in the Quran that other people didn't recite, and he won't leave it because he heard it from Muhammad himself. So abrogation, a very interesting phenomenon. It adds a whole other dimension to the issue of Quranic preservation. Don't worry, I think they're just murdering someone out there. <laughs> yes, sir. On this abrogation, then, what's the picture of God as being? I mean, we see God as immutable, but through abrogation, we see a change in God uh, that loves him to worship. Uh, Muslims will often defend the concept of abrogation by saying it's part of the Quran's beauty that Allah would guide his people with certain revelations and then when it no longer applied to them, they he would change the revelation. Um, and so they say that as kind of a mercy of the Quran uh, and they don't see it as 
uh, as compromising the, the inspiration of the Quran at all. I see a problem with that, a big problem with that, and they rarely talk about it, and that's, you can see that here. Look at the verse that Sayyid Muslim records, which is no longer in the Quran. If there were two valleys full of riches for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley, and nothing would fill the son of Adam but dust. Well, hold on a second. The Muslim scholars are saying that abrogation is either of command or verse. You know, all the forms of abrogation have to do with commands. And that's why uh, it's seen as a mercy, because certain times certain commands apply, other times they don't. But you shouldn't be able to uh, abrogate something that has a historical record. There's no change. It doesn't affect the Muslim community. If it's historical, it's historical. Why abrogate it? This verse is not a command at all. It's a historical account. Why was it abrogated? And I have not seen an answer to that anywhere. Uh, the, only, the only answer that I've seen uh, was by Yasser Qadi uh, in, in his book, uh, The Sciences, An Introduction to the Science of the Quran. And his response was, well, maybe there should be a fourth type of abrogation. Um, so uh, it, it's kind of ad hoc. It is a very, it's a difficulty they have to wrestle with. Uh, you mentioned how the alternative uh, readings, um, like an infuriated, I think it was Umar, um, could a Muslim scholar respond and say like, the reason he was infuriated is because a name was being mispronounced or something like that as opposed to like a doctrine? Or they could try, but there's so many hadith along this line um, that that wouldn't be justified. Like we said, there, Muhammad said, even to the extent of, you can say whatever you want, as long as you don't replace justice with mercy and mercy with justice. In other words, don't turn around the meaning of the verse, say whatever you want. Um, those hadith really make it impractical for a scholar to say uh, that this is just names. Is a cameraman still in here, out of curiosity? He just stepped outside. He just stepped out. I'm wondering, okay, yeah. I'm following up on the abrogation there. They don't see this as him constantly changing. Again, they see it as him providing mercy. Oh, so the question was, um, <laughs> so how, how, can we, uh, how can Muslims reconcile the unknowability of God with the changing nature of the Quran? Um, and they don't see this as God changing. They see this as God being merciful for his people and by accommodating for them. Hey, cameraman friend. Yes. Um, is the, uh, is the picture coming out all right? Is it too dark? Yeah, no, it's fine. All right, that's an amazing camera. Okay, thanks. I can see it. Cool. <laughs> I mean, this tie is pretty schnazzy. You wouldn't want it to <laughs> go to waste. Okay. Now, I had mentioned Ubay ibn Qab, uh, and there's a lot more there. There were significant early disputes regarding the Quran. The reason why Abu Bakr ordered his first collection is found in Sahih Bukhari. Again, book 61, number 510. A verse from Surah Azab was, oh, I'm sorry, this is a different. Okay, I'm sorry, let me backtrack real quick. Remember how I said that uh, Abu Bakr had collected the Quran first and then later Uthman came and brought that one back? Yeah. Well, when Uthman came back and made a final version, this is something that Zayd said. He said, a, a verse from Surah Azab was missed by me when we copied the Quran, the first one. He missed a verse. And we used to hear Allah's apostle reciting it. So we searched for it and found it with Khuzayma bin Thabit al-Ansari. What's he saying? He's saying that they missed verses in the first re record. Very interesting. How did that happen? So as far as early disputes are concerned, Abu Bakr ordered a first collection and the collection was found faulty and there's still a record of that in Sahih Bukhari. Then Uthman ordered a second collection and more disputes began to arise after the Uthmanic codification. So we mentioned Ubay ibn Qab, we mentioned how he would not leave certain verses out. He is one of two people that Muhammad picked out, I'm sorry, he's one of four people that Muhammad picked out as the best teachers of the Quran. So according to Sahih Bukhari, Muhammad says, if you want to learn the Quran, 
learn from these four. And he names Abdullah ibn Mas'ud first, then he names Salim and Muad, and then he names Ubay ibn Kaab. Two of those four people are right here, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Ubay ibn Kaab. We've already seen Ubay has said that he will not leave out certain verses that other people leave out. But even more interesting is Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud named first by Muhammad, probably the best teacher of the Quran in his time, and extremely well respected amongst Muslims for his knowledge of the Quran. According to Ibn Sa'd's Tabakat, he says, the people have been guilty of deceit in the reading of the Quran. I like it better to read according to the recitation of him whom I love more than that of Zayd ibn Thabit. Now I've been uh, called to account on this. I, I had a debate back in 2009 um, with a Muslim uh, by the name of Bassam Zawadi. And he says that this is a poor translation. The people have been guilty of deceit. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I've looked into this. I've talked to Arab speakers about this. There are multiple ways you can translate it. But at the very least, let's concede that this is a poor translation. Still, what Ibn Masud is saying is that this translation of the Quran, uh, Zayd's version, I'm sorry, of the Quran, uh, involves some level of hiding the truth, uh, hiding the true version of the Quran. Um, and he ordered, not just, this is not just found in Ibn Sa'd, by the way, it's found in Jami at Tirmidhi, it's found in, in various places. And Jami at Tirmidhi is considered a very trustworthy book of, of Hadith. Um, Ibn Masud uh, said to his people that if they kept the manuscripts, keep your manuscripts with you, if you will, you will receive, receive rewards in heaven. So here come Uthman's men, they're trying to get Ibn Masud to give up his manuscript. They're trying to get Ibn Masud's students to give up their manuscripts. Um, where have Ibn Masud and his students been? They've been in an area of the Islamic empire called Kufa. They went, he went there to teach the Quran to those Muslims because he was such a great teacher. Uthman's men come from far away later and they say, you have to give up everything. You have to give up your Quran, your manuscripts, your students have to give them all up too. And we're replacing it with this one. Ibn Masud tells his students, do not give up your manuscripts. Take them with you to heaven where you'll be rewarded. That's a big deal. Why does he disagree so much? Is it just minor words? Is it proper names? What is it? Ibn Masud actually believed that there should be 111 chapters in the Quran. And today's Quran has 114 chapters. <coughs> Ibn Masud, the greatest teacher of the Quran, named first by Muhammad, if you're going to learn the Quran, disagreed that chapter 1 of the Quran should be a part of the Quran. He did not include it. Chapter 113 of the Quran and chapter 114 of the Quran. So 1, 113, and 114, he does not include in his Quran. Why? Ibn Masud considered these chapters to be prayers that Allah had divinely inspired, so they are divinely inspired, but Allah did not intend for them to be a part of the Quran. So Ibn Masud is coming at these chapters with a little bit more precision than Zayd did. For those of you who don't know, um, chapter one of the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha, is kind of called the keystone for the Quran. Uh, it's seven verses, and it's understood to be basically an introduction to the entire Quran. When you read the Salat, or when the Salat is read by Muslims, the five daily prayers, they read Surah Fatiha first. They read the Fatiha first, and then they'll read a portion of the Quran. So liturgically speaking, you introduce the Quran, even in Salat, with Fatiha. Ibn Masud didn't consider that introduction to actually be part of the Quran, whereas Zayd ibn Thabit did. Why is that? Because Ibn Masud takes a look at the words in Fatiha, um, and the words are not from Allah to men. The rest of the Quran is written in the voice of Allah to men, and we did this, and we did that, and we told you this, and we sent this. Surah Al-Fatiha doesn't read that way. It's a prayer to Allah from people. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praise be to God, Lord of all the worlds. So it's people praising God and asking Him for, for uh, personal guidance. So Ibn Masud says, yes, this is divinely inspired, but it's a prayer that God sent. It's not supposed to be part of the Quran. And he says the same thing of chapter 113 and chapter 114. Now chapter 113 and 114 are virtually all um, 
written in the voice of people back to Allah as well. But it starts with the word qul. So Surah Al-Fulaq, chapter 113, Surah Al-Nas, chapter 114, starts with the word qul, say, and then it's a prayer. Ibn Masud said these are supposed to be prayers, not part of the Quran. Ubay ibn Kaab, on the other hand, says not only are these chapters supposed to be part of the Quran, but two other chapters are supposed to be part of the Quran. Al-Haft and Al-Khal. Now, Al-Haft and Al-Khal, one of those chapters is still recited by Muslims today. It's recited during the, the prayer that is offered after the last prayer of the night. So Isha is the last prayer of the night. Uh, it's the last of the five obligatory prayers. But then there's another prayer which most Muslims consider obligatory, though not quite as obligatory as the other five. And it's called the Vitr prayer. And during that Vitr prayer, you recite this chapter. So Muslims still recite it even today, but they don't consider it part of the Quran. Ubay did consider it part of the Quran. What is interesting here? I'm not saying that Zayd was wrong and one of these other two were right. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that there is disparity amongst the chosen teachers of the Quran. How can we be certain that Zayd is the one who got it right? And if he is the one who got it right, why are the teachers that Muhammad chose wrong? And why are they wrong in such a disparate fashion? Why was there so much disagreement here? Interestingly, there is some agreement between Ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Gab over Zayd ibn Thabit. What do I mean by that? Well, they both included the verse of stoning in their Qurans, and Zayd did not. Very interesting. There were other agreements as well among the two. How do we know these things, by the way? Where do we find this in record? Why would Muslims have saved this? Um, why did they not destroy all the records of this? Well, in fact, they did. Um, there were three major books that recorded the differences in various manuscripts. Uh, probably more than that, but three that we know of. And all three of them were lost to history. One of them was found by a man named Arthur Jeffrey in the early 20th century. Arthur Jeffrey is probably the father of modern critical Quranic studies. Um, he, he recorded in his book materials uh, on the history of the Quran. It, we just call it materials, Arthur Jeffrey's materials. Um, he recorded, he found this book. Um, I have it written down somewhere. I'll just point it to you briefly. Help. Okay, I won't. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the name, and hopefully, can we figure this out, someone? Um, why the projector went off? Do we have anyone? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, while we're working on that, the book is called uh, Ibn Abi Daud, so I-B-N, A-B-I, Ibn Abi Daud, D-A-U-D. You can turn the lights on in the meantime. Um, so. You might remember the name Daud. This is Sunan Abu Daud, the guy, the Imam who wrote Sunan Abu Daud. It's his son, Ibn Abi Daud. He made it his duty to collect differences in Quranic manuscripts. That's what he wanted to do. That was his form of worshiping Allah. He wanted to collect differences in the Quranic manuscripts. And he recorded differences between uh, not just these three, he also recorded others. Um, for example, Abu Musa and Abu Musa's Quran. Um, so we have that. We have Arthur Jeffrey's copy of the discovery that he found of Kitab al-Masahif. Okay. Okay. Any questions, by the way, at this point? Yes, sir. Going back to um, abrogation, how, how do they reconcile that with the idea that there's an eternal tablet in heaven with the word of the Quran I have not seen, uh, so the question was, um, how do, we, how do we reconcile the fact that abrogation occurs alongside this tablet? I have not seen a good explanation. Yes, sir. Um, Uthman was the one that collected a bunch of the Qurans and then uh, created the, I guess, um, the kind of like the, can the canonized standard version of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then he destroyed <coughs> destroyed the the other ones that differed. Yes. Uh, did it was how, I guess how was that received by <laughs> the people who would see those as you know authentic uh, Quran? So that's a good question. Um, why is it that he was allowed to do this? I will tell you that Uthman was not well received by most Muslims. They didn't like him. Um, I wouldn't say that's because of this. This, this might have been an additional factor or who knows. Um, but he was not well received to begin with. The authority that he had uh, to do this, he basically derived from Abu Bakr. Because Abu Bakr, when Omar said we should collect the Quran, Abu Bakr had said, this is a good idea, let's do it. Uh, and so he used that authority um, to continue on with the project. That's according to the Islamic sources. Uh, we can't know for sure whether that happened, but that's what they say. In addition, he was the caliph. He was officially in charge of the Islamic empire. So even though people didn't like him, he had a degree of authority and he used that. Uh, Ibn Masud, there are some sources which say that Ibn Masud actually got beaten because he would not give up his version of the Quran. Uh, ultimately, he did give it up. Um, whether or not that's accurate, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't actually seen that written. I've heard that that's in the sources. Uh, regardless, Ibn Masud was very, very much opposed to this version of the Quran. Um, and the power that Uthman had to exert over him was significant in order for him to ultimately yield. Yes, sir. Can you re uh, the IBN Dao, can you respell that full name again? Yeah, so it's uh, Ibn, IBN, Abi, A B I, Daud, D, D A U D. And you can find his work saved still in the pages of Arthur Jeffrey's materials. I think it's materials for the history of the collection of the Quran, materials something. Okay. Now, in order to understand the extent to which uh, early Muslims differed from modern Muslims, modern Muslims will tell you the Quran has never been changed. We have all of it uh, down to, a, down to a, a, a exact dot. Nothing has been changed. Early Muslims differed with that. Let me read you a quotation from Umar's son. So we've been introduced to Umar. Again, he's the second caliph. This is his son, so Ibn Umar. It says, uh, Mm -hmm. Let none of you say, I have learned the whole of the Qur'an. For how does he know what the whole of it is, when much of it has disappeared? Let him rather say, I have learned what is extant thereof. Whoa. Omar's son is saying, don't say you know the whole Qur'an. How do you know what it all is? A lot of it has been lost. This is found in Kitab al-Fada'il. By the way, uh, you guys are going to receive in your email a copy of all my slides. Um, so don't worry about getting the spelling down exactly. As long as you're, as long as you're registered, uh, you'll get a PDF form of the slides. Okay. Um, so this is Ibn Umar. It's found in Abu Ubaid's Kitab al-Fada'il. Now, Ibn Abi Daud, so the guy who wrote down the differences in the manuscripts, this is what he said. Many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama. What's the day of Yamama? You remember yesterday I was talking about Abu Bakr? As soon as Muhammad died, a bunch of people left Islam. You remember that? Abu Bakr had to launch the apostate wars. Well, one of those wars, uh, one of the battles during that war was called the Battle of Yamama. And during that time, Muslims believed that Allah would guard the Quran. But not only would he guard the actual words of the Quran, he would guard the people who knew the Quran. That was kind of a belief. And so they sent a bunch of people who knew the Quran very well into battle. And guess what? A lot of them died. Uh, the records say up to 500 of them died that day. That's what he's talking about here. So many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the battle of Yamama. But they were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Qur'an. Nor were they found with even one person after them. So Ibn Abi Dawud is being very careful to say, they're gone. They're as gone as gone can be. 
uh, a threefold repetition of the fact that those verses simply aren't there. So we've got these early disputes, we've got early manuscripts which say that uh, there were differences, and you've got people who are actually recording the differences in the Quran. Some of these differences, by the way, extended not just in the words, uh, in the verses, in the chapters that were included, but also the surah order. So the order of the surahs were different um, amongst these people, and you can find those in the records as well. Any questions so far? Yes. How many years after Muhammad's death was it when uh, this gentleman were, uh, made that statement? Ibn Abi Dawud? Yeah, the son of the killed. So Sunan Abu Dawud was, so Abu Dawud, his father. Okay, the question was, uh, <laughs> when, does, uh, when does Ibn Abi Dawud write? Um, and uh, we remember the Imam who wrote Sunan Abu Dawud. He died at the end of the ninth century. Um, so this is probably late 9th, early 10th century. Yes, sir. So you're saying the, verse, we get it, the verses have changed, the people are saying there's changing, and then you said there was one other change that showed that they shifted? Um, I said it just a moment ago. I said that the surah order. Yeah, the surah, thank you. Yeah, so the order of the chapters in the Quran are different. Now remember how I said that uh, the verses or the words in the Quran, the script wasn't able to capture all the Arabic, right? You didn't have the tashkil, you didn't have the nukat, you didn't have the vocalics and the dots. Um, people would therefore read the Quran differently. They read it as they saw fit. Um, they tried to follow oral tradition, but they began to read it differently. Over time, there were dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of different ways to read the Quran. People began to read the Quran in all kinds of different ways because the script did not tell people how exactly to read it. These different ways to read the Quran were called qirat. Today people will say, oh, they were simply different dialects. Well, that's not really true. Um, there was more than dialectical differences in the qirat. In the year 323 AD, a man named Ibn Mujahid limited the number of canonical qirat. He said, we should cut down the number of qirat to seven. And so he eliminated the vast majority of qirat and said, these seven are the ones that you can use officially. Um, it's Ibn Mujahid, 323 AD. Um, so Ibn Mujahid at this point, it, it's argued that later Ibn Mujahid changed his mind and he allowed for 10 or maybe even more. Um, but at least at first, he cut it down to seven different ways to recite the Qur'an officially. Up until then, people were reciting it in many, many different ways as they had learned in their areas and as they could read it. Ibn Mujahid, when he cuts it down, after that point, if anyone read according to a previously accepted way, but no longer accepted way, he was punished. Uh, and we know this because a year later, a man named Ibn Shanabud uh, and you'll get, the, you'll, you'll get the spelling for his name later. Um, he tried to read the Quran according to an old Qirat, and he was beaten for it. Um, this is just a year later, and he's trying to read the Quran according to ways that he had known since childhood, and he was beaten for it. I consider uh, this to be one of the three major milestones of the development of the Quran. So the first was the codification by Uthman. The second was this, Ibn Mujahid's recension down to seven qirat. Over time, by the way, each of these qirat develops multiple ways of being read. So uh, Keith Small, who's a scholar out of London School of Theology, um, he has said that there were ultimately 10 qirat that were each read eight different ways. 10 qirat that were each read eight different ways. And so what you have is someone's qirra read according to someone's reading. 80 different ones, uh, ultimately, by the time 1924 rolls around. So in 1924, there are 80 different ways to read things. Um, 10 major kira, eight different ways to read them. In 1924, Muslims published the first printed Quran. Up until this point, there was no printed Quran except by Westerners. Um, and even those Qurans were not really acceptable according to Muslims. 
And so the printed Qurans first happened in 1924. What happened was a committee of people came together in Cairo and they chose an ancient looking orthography. So basically something that looked ancient in writing. They chose one and they used that. It wasn't really an orthography that existed before. They kind of made it for this purpose. And they used that for the printing of the Quran. They chose one of the 80 different qira, uh, the one called Hafs an Asim. So it's the, the qira of Hafs as read by Asim. Hafs an Asim. They chose that one and they printed that. That Quran has become the common Quran today. 97% of the Muslim world uses that Quran. The other 3% uses another qira called Warsh an Nafi. Um, so certain places in Yemen, for example, and um, other places in the Middle East use this other reading of the Quran, Warsh an Nafi. And you can go there and you can get a Warsh an Nafi Quran and you can compare it to a Hafsan an Asim Quran and you'll see the differences. It's still there. Aside from these two Qirra, most of the rest of them are gone. They're eradicated. You can go to, uh, you know, these academic institutions and talk to a scholar and they might be able to recount older Qirras for you. But practically speaking, they've been eradicated. And there's mainly one, and I'm pretty convinced that uh, uh, the Warsh will be gone soon. It's just going to go out of public use because Hafsa and Asim has pretty much taken over. I think that's the third milestone in Quranic development, the 1924 printing of the Royal Cairo edition of the Quran. When a Muslim looks at his Quran today, he is looking at the 1924 edition of the Quran. If you were to press a Muslim, uh, or anyone for that matter, and say, when is the first, or what, what copy of the Quran, what manuscript do we have that looks exactly like this? What is the first one that we have that looks exactly like this? There is none. The first time we have a manuscript that looks like that is in 1924. So, we're about to make a huge shift in our approach right now to the Quranic study, so if there are any questions. Yes? Uh, I guess practically, do you, do you, is this the sort of stuff that you, you bring up um, in a casual conversation? Uh, or is this only things you, like you said before, you'd only bring up once you've established a, a pretty strong relationship and um, they trust you and things like that? I believe, uh, okay, so the question was, do I bring this, do you bring this stuff up in, uh, in common conversation or only after you've developed a close relationship? I think that this information, it certainly has not reached the common Muslim. It definitely has not. I think that this information has the potential to shake the Muslim world. It is, it's ineffable just how much stock Muslims take in the perfect preservation of the Quran. They see this as the vindication of their faith, that the Quran has been perfectly preserved is the way you can know Islam is true. Um, it's the basis for many Muslims' faith. And it's also their basis for rejecting Christianity. You know, the Bible's been corrupted, etc. This is information that I honestly think will shake the Muslim world if it gets shared effectively. I don't profess to have a good model for doing it, but right now I am not hesitant to share this publicly. Um, and I share it with whoever I run across. Now, I don't say to them, hey, your Quran's corrupt, check this out. I <laughs> I, that's, that's not how I would do it. Um, I would wait until they would say, the Quran has been changed, your Bible has, I mean, your Bible has been changed, the Quran has not. I would say, my response to that point is, really, what do you mean by that? Can you give me some details? I'm really interested in that, because I, I don't think that's true. If it were true, then I'm, I might agree with you. Um, and then they would say, the Bible has had verses that were added and taken out. Mm -hmm. Well, the Quran has had that. No, it hasn't. Here, look in Sayyid Bukhari, it says that right here. Okay, well, we know what the original Quran said because we still have it today. Really, what was the oldest, what's the oldest Quran that you have today? We have Umar's Quran, we have the Quran, I'm sorry, Uthman's Quran, the Quran that he sent out. We have that today. Uh, you do, how many of them do you have? We have two of them. We have one sent to this place and one sent to this place. Are they exactly the same? No. 
the two that Uthman sent out that we still have there are different. Um, so which one's accurate? You know, just I would I would start pressing. Um, now, when it comes to public presentation, I did a presentation at Rutgers University a few weeks ago on this issue. Um, and so I'm trying to get this information out there. Uh, I do not have the credentials, though. I'm not an Islamic scholar yet. I'm in the process. I'm hopefully going to get there. Um, but there is a man by the name of Keith Small. I mentioned his name earlier. He is a scholar on Islam. And he wrote his dissertation on this topic. And you can purchase it from Amazon. Um, Keith Small. Uh, Textual Variants in Quran Manuscripts, I think it's called. Textual Variants in Quranic Manuscripts. Is that uh, the more complicated version of his Holy Books Have a mm -hmm. History? It is. So he wrote another book on the popular level called Holy Books Have a History, which you can purchase for five bucks. Just type it in online. Um, and that's for, you know, lay people. His book on uh, Textual Variants, he emphasizes one portion of the Quran. Uh, it has a parallel in the Bible. It's a section about Abraham. Um, and he really goes in depth on that. That's what you have to do as a scholar. You have to phew, zoom, zoom in on one section. I think that's not as effective on the mass level. I think we need to talk about everything. We need to talk about the ahruf. We need to talk about the abrogation. We need to talk about what I'm about to talk about, which no one really does. Um, so, yeah. Definitely get Keith Small's book, Holy Books Have a History. It compares the variants in the Bible to the variants in the Quran. I spoke to Keith uh, a few months ago, and I asked him, I said, uh, what do you think about, what did you think when you started writing about the variants in the Bible and the variants in the Quran, which, which is more problematic? And he said, when I came into this, I thought that the Quran and the Bible had similar types of variants and they were on equal footing. And I said, when he came out, he says, I think the Quran is on far worse footing than the Bible. Um, so after careful scholastic research, he has concluded that the Quran is on more difficult footing than the Bible. Um, I think so only because of the Uthmanic recension. I don't think we can take the Quran back before Uthman if the Uthmanic recension actually happened. Um, and for that reason, it's on worse footing. Uh, and also for what I'm about to show. Uh, in the back. Oh, no one's told me I don't have the credentials. Uh, the question was, uh, who doesn't accept what you're saying because I don't have the credentials? Uh, no one's told me, Nabil, you don't have the credentials. Um, but there's a reason why people, you know, publish on a peer-reviewed level. It's so that you can be vetted through the scholarly system so that what you say can be checked by others and so that you can establish a level of credibility, which I don't have, not yet. Um, so. Uh, wh why I'm referring you to Keith Small over me is because you know, he's a legitimate PhD scholar in Islamic studies. Uh, I'm just trying to take what they say, what scholars say, process it and share it with you. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'm on my way there, but I'm not yet. Yes, sir. Um, I'm a pastor with a church where most of the people are from Indonesia. And so when they talk about abrogation, the one that's really important to them has to do with uh, passages where uh, Muhammad and mercy, but then they're abrogated by, uh, you know, violent, violent passages, and so, because that's what they experience, a lot of hostility mm. and brutality. So, how uh, important is that with, say, most Muslims that live in America, that particular case? So the question is, um, abrogation and peace and violence, how does that all play together and how important is that to Muslims in America? Um, that is stuff we're going to be covering tomorrow. Um, we're going to be going into issues of jihad, uh, peace and violence, terrorism, uh, Islam today, basically. We're going to be looking at that tomorrow. Yes? Um, how did Muhammad die? And how old was he? How did Muhammad die and how old was he? Um, how about you write that question down? Let's deal with that tomorrow. Um, because uh, I think we're on a good groove right now with the Quran. So let's keep going on the Quran. And then, are you going to be back tomorrow? Uh, no. You're not? Okay, well, we'll, we'll address that then. Um, <laughs> there, there's controversy on that issue. Uh, my friend David put up a, an interesting video on that. It's called, Who, Who Killed Muhammad? 
Um, it's, uh, <laughs> David doesn't mind being a bit inflammatory. Um, you should go to his blog, very, very interesting stuff. Uh, so he, <laughs> he basically concludes that Allah killed Muhammad. Um, and uh, the way he does that, he, he says that Muhammad had said earlier on in his life that if Allah were to uh, condemn a false prophet, he would sever his aorta. Um, in other words, he would just drop him, kill him dead. Um, and then Muhammad was actually, uh, after he had defeated in battle a tribe of Jews, he was received in a reception by a Jewish woman. A Jewish woman from that tribe wanted to offer you know, a conciliatory dinner, and so she makes food. Uh, nothing suspicious about that. Turns out she, uh, <laughs> turns out she had poisoned the food. Um, so Muhammad takes a bite of it. According to the sources, he takes a bite. He realizes that it's been poisoned. He says, Allah has informed me that the lamb is poisoned, or the lamb has informed me that it is poisoned, I don't remember. And, um, and he tells people to stop eating. Well, one of his friends had already really dug in, and he ended up dying. Um, and so Muhammad called the, the Jewish woman, and he said, what, have you, what is this you have done? And she said, I wanted to see if you were a true prophet. If you were, you wouldn't have eaten it. And if you were not, you would have eaten it. Um, well, he uh, kills her. And then he uh, ultimately, <laughs> he, as he is dying, there's a lot of Muslim sources that say that this death was a result of that poisoning. Um, he was at the time 62 or 63. And it says that uh, the death was on account of the poisoning. And what's interesting, and this is what David points out, is that some of the Islamic sources say, as he was dying, he said, I feel as if my aorta has been severed. Um, so I am quoting David Wood on virtually all of this. I haven't looked into the death of Muhammad that carefully. But I hope that answers your question. Let's, uh, for, unless you're going to be not here tomorrow, let's stick with uh, Quran questions. Yes, sir, in the back. Regarding the Yeah, they're not large differences. They are not large differences. Uh, the question was, how different are the, the different kirat? Um, and they're not that different. Uh, sometimes they did play out into meaning, the difference of the kirat. And most of the time, though, it was just different ways of recitation. Um, but we can see those. Uh, a lot of the kirat that are preserved in the records, at least those 80, um, are preserved in the records, especially the main 10, off of which they were derivative. Yes? So I've only debated the issue of the Quran once, the, the textual preservation of the Quran, and it was with uh, Bassam Zawadi. And I have tremendous respect for Bassam. I think he is one of the great, greater Muslim apologists out there. He is, uh, he is careful with his work, and um, he doesn't make ad hoc arguments as often as others do. Um, his response was, Allah intended the Quran to be changed exactly as it was changed. Um, so his response is a theological one which is what I pointed out in my conclusion. You can watch this debate online as well, uh, on my website. I was shocked. I was shocked he admitted as much as he did, and uh, that kind of caught me off guard. So you can see me kind of like, whoa, <laughs> he just <laughs> admitted everything. I didn't know what to say at that point. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so you can watch the debate, but I pointed out in the debate, your defense is a theological defense. Uh, we're talking historically. Has the Quran been perfectly preserved? Uh, the answer historically is no. If you want to say that the changes are what Allah intended, uh, you, that is a statement of faith, not an objective statement. But he's the only one I've seen debate that issue. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we've now got the Dead Sea Scrolls, which the more and more they dig into them, the more and more they match the Old Testament. I mean, you've added a few verses. I know Samuel's had a verse that got added that made the whole passage make sense. Uh, just didn't end in mid-sentence. And so we're not probably as corrupted as the Quran. Now, how do Muslims say, answer that now when we're getting all this scientific information that our, at least the, the Old Testament from the Dead Sea Scrolls is pretty accurate? So the question is, how do Muslims 
respond to the fact that the texts of the Old Testament, um, at least, are probably more accurate than the texts of the Quran. They don't think that. They will say that the text of the Quran was perfectly preserved because they will say Muslims had memorized the Quran. So many Muslims had memorized the Quran from the mouth of Muhammad uh, that how could there have been any changes introduced? When it comes to statements like Ibn Abi Daud's and Ibn Umar's, they will say, ah, those are not from the Hadith, we can't trust those. Um, so they, they'll often just throw them out uh, and they'll just point to the Bible as having been corrupted. On that note, um, just uh, this is a total aside, I'm giving you this for free. Um, we, were, uh, we were in, uh, oh, I'm not allowed to say where. I was somewhere a few weeks ago, um, and, uh, and we um, uncovered, uh, I think I can say who was there. I mean, Lee Strobel was there, Mark Middleberg was there, uh, Dan Wallace was there, um, and it was, a, it was basically a cache of manuscripts were found, and they're beginning to be vetted. Um, many of you may have heard yeah. that the first century manuscript of Mark was found. Have you heard that? Yeah. That's awesome. First century, well they haven't, it hasn't gone through the process of, of dating by many scholars' hands. It's, that's happening right now. But there is a very well-known paleographer whose credentials are unsurpassable, who said that he was certain that this is a first century document. Um, he, uh, well, there's more to that story, but anyhow. Uh, there were also early second century manuscripts of Romans, Luke, that were found in this cache. We were invited to come and uncover a new portion of the cache. And uh, what I found, along with a friend of mine, um, Abdu, uh, Abdu uh, Murray, he's an apologist from Michigan, was the earliest, potentially, the earliest Greek manuscript of Isaiah. Um, potentially first century BC or first century AD. Uh, so that's really cool. There is some really cool stuff getting uncovered right now. And uh, the world of textual criticism uh, of New Testament, Old Testament manuscripts is undergoing a quantum leap right now. Uh, you'll see this stuff coming out in the next few years. The Greek scroll of Isaiah, 150 to 250 BC, using carbon dating. Okay, Paleo what did the paleography put it at? Okay, when was that? Yeah. It was, I think, in 85. Interesting, okay, I did not know about that. When, when we looked into the dating of uh, Greek Isaiah manuscripts, we didn't see that. So perhaps that's there. Did it have a New Testament reference in it? Um, yeah, I think that was one of the distinguishing features of what we found was that it had a, it had a reference to the New Testament in it. Um, not a reference to, I'm sorry. The New Testament referred to a verse that was here. Mm -hmm. So you have New Testament corroboration to a verse here. Uh, but anyhow, that'll be out in the next few years. Yes, sir. Yeah, so back to the uh, original question up from her. Uh, you said that uh, Islam would say, well, we quoted it so often. Wouldn't the Jews say the same thing about the Old Testament or their uh, Holy Scripture? Yes, um, but uh, so the question was, don't the Jews also say that they had memorized portions of the Old Testament? Um, yes, but the Muslims don't really think that the Jews had memorized it as well as the Muslims had memorized the Quran. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, going back to what you said earlier about two of the uh, Uthman's uh, texts still being in our possession, these are the originals, these are copies, these are... So, I, I'm not convinced that they are Uthmanic, and a lot of scholars are not convinced that they are Uthmanic, but Muslims generally are. Um, they're called the Tashkent Manuscript and the Samarkand Manuscript. Um, the Tashkent, I believe, is also called the Top Copy Manuscript. 
Um, and they're found in Turkey. And I think Samarkand is where the other one's found. Um, there's actually a Turkish scholar who, or two Turkish scholars, who went through and compared the differences and they put out a book comparing the differences between the two. Um, so, Turkish Muslim scholars. So you can just point. One's in Turkey and where's the other? I think it's in Samarkand. Oh. Okay. So, yeah, that's out there. It's interesting, there are actually multiple Qurans today uh, when, uh, which claim to be the Quran Omar was reading when he was murdered. So it's like, okay, how many Qurans was he reading at the same time? Um, so, okay. All right, so what I'm about to, yes sir? Yeah, last question. I heard that uh, Muslims believe the Old Testament is accurate, but the New isn't, or do they think the whole Bible is corrupted? Oh, they think the whole thing's corrupted. Yeah, so Muslims think both the Old Testament and the New Testament are corrupted. We'll deal with that a little bit more tomorrow. So what I'm about to give you now um, is, as far as the apologetic world is concerned, I have never seen this introduced in apologetics. I don't know why. Uh, this is a more or less cutting edge conclusion, um, and I wrote my thesis on this at Duke. Um, but it's going to take a moment for, if you want to really grasp it, how I want to share it with you, it'll take some background. So I hope you don't mind. Um, what, we're not, what we're now going to talk about is the Quran as an oral text. To summarize before we start, I think we can be fairly certain that Muhammad never intended the Quran to be written. I think we can be fairly certain Muhammad did not envision the Quran as a written book, but as a spoken book. And I'm going to draw together a lot of the evidence we just talked about to, towards that end. First, um, what I want to point out is that the Quran is written often using oral formulae. Um, where did I? Did I skip? Yeah, I did skip something. Uh, oral formulae are understood as uh, a feature that was found in composition, uh, in extemporaneous composition. Hear me out for a second. In the early 20th century, uh, a man by the name of Milman Perry was studying the Homeric uh, epics, so basically the Iliad and the Odyssey. And people had been studying the Iliad and the Odyssey for a long time, and there were some portions of the Iliad and the Odyssey where people just said, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't, we, we don't see why things are working this way. And a lot of people had issues with the Homeric epics. What Milman Perry did was he traveled through various places, uh, through Slavic regions, and he listened to storytellers who had memorized stories and who used to repeat them extemporaneously. And he determined that people would often compose this poetry on the fly. This wasn't stuff that they had memorized. They, they were general stories that they had memorized, but on the fly, they would say portions that they remembered, and they would add endings and whatnot in order to make the meter and the rhyme work. And he said that essentially, this is what happened with the Homeric epics. That what was going on at that time was people were composing this stuff on the fly. Word for word, verbatim stories were not necessary. In order for Homer's Iliad to be Homer's Iliad, it didn't have to be word for word the same. There was kind of a general uh, motif, set of verses. You could leave certain stuff out. You could emphasize certain stuff. You can elaborate depending on the occasion. It would still be Homer's Iliad. It would still be the Odyssey. And that's what Slavic poets were doing at the time. So oral poetry had these, these uh, oral formulae in it. So these are called oral formulae. Uh, where you could take out certain words, replace them with other words, and it would still basically mean the same thing, and it would still have the same meter and rhyme, it would still be the same poem. That created a revolution in thought. All of a sudden, people said, wait a minute, we have always applied written dynamics, so dynamics of literate storytellers, of literate writers, to these ancient works. Perhaps people, before knowing how to write, thought differently. Perhaps they wrote differently, and by writing they mean composed orally. They composed things differently, their thought was different. So the field of classical studies just took off in this direction of orality. A man by the name, so that was Milman Perry, you should know that name, 
Milman Perry and his work on the Homeric epics. P-A-R-R-Y, Perry. A man by the name of Walter Ong then went and took that a lot further, and he said, we can know that people who have not become literate think very differently from people who are literate. For example, they don't categorize things the same way literate people do. They don't go in depth in arguments the way literate people do. When you're writing something out, you can write it, and then you can go further and further in depth. Whereas pre-literate people, they will make an argument, and then they will add to it, and add to it. They'll emphasize in various ways. So they'll say the same thing in multiple angles, whereas in literate analysis, you'll go deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, in pre-literate uh, compositions, you'll have a lot of repetition. You'll say a lot of the same thing over and over again. Why? Because the people who are hearing the composition, they can't flip the page and look at something again. If you want them to remember something, they're not going to be able to go back and look at it. You have to repeat it for them. So you're going to have a lot of repetition in, in these compositions. Uh, you're going to have a lot of antagonism. Um, there's going to be a lot of black and white. We're the good guys. They're the bad guys. That's how pre-literate people see things. Um, so you have these characteristics, these psychodynamics of pre-literate composers. That's the work of Walter Ong. Very recently, uh, about last year actually, uh, a man by the name of Andrew Bannister, who uh, works with RZIM, and he was studying out of the London School of Theology, he's now part of RZIM Canada. He wrote his dissertation on the fact that the Quran is composed in oral formulae. So the Quran itself is composed of a majority oral formulae. Some verses he said, or some chapters he said, even into about 74, 75%, I think he said 74%, oral formulaic. So the Quran is composed essentially in a manner we would expect someone to compose something on the fly. And that fits. Remember that hadith we saw where it says, you can say Aziz and Alim or Sami and Hakim or whatever you want, right? You can change the verse endings however you want. That fits this whole concept of oral formulae where you can switch words around and it's okay. The ahruf, the, the ability to re replace certain verses, certain words, that fits this whole concept. Um, parallel to him, actually before him, uh, a man by the name of William Graham. Um, he's, he's still around, he's still a scholar. He wrote that the Quran was intended to be an oral text. And it wasn't until Uthman came that it became a written text. And that is kind of the theory that we're, we're getting at right now. So this, I just gave you the contours of scholarship basically right now. Uh, how scholarship has gotten to this point, that the Quran was potentially not even a written text, just an oral text. We see that happening in a lot of other works. Uh, we see it happening um, in Homeric epics. We see it happening in African works, English works. They say Beowulf was of the same nature. Um, so a lot of work has been done in that field, and people are beginning to apply this theory to the Quran. Now let's look a little bit more closely at the internal features of the Quran, which point that perhaps it was an oral text. We've already talked about the oral formulae. We've seen that a lot of the Quran was composed in oral formula. There's a lot of antagonistic thought in the Quran. Uh, according to Walter Ong, this, this antagonism is prevalent in preliterate thought, and that's what we see in the Quran. The side-by-side -side arrangement, instead of going deeper and deeper, the side-by-side -side arrangement of arguments and of sections of a book, we see that too in, uh, in the Quran. We see it a lot. In fact, the surahs themselves, uh, what does the word surah mean? It doesn't mean chapter, it's how it's used, but that's not what it originally meant. The word surah meant basically a fence, a fencing, or the walls of a city, or something that encompasses. And so when Muhammad says, put these verses in that surah, He's using the term as kind of a genre. Put, this, put, this, put these verses along with those, just kind of throw it in there, in that section of, of verses. He's not seeing this as a book where he's saying, okay, in, put it in this order exactly here. No, he's kind of putting these verses together and they're gonna end up looking side by side. They're not deeper and deeper, they go side by side just like oral compositions do. So the way the surahs are arranged and the fact that they are surahs points to the probability of the Quran was composed in oral composition. Another thing that Walter Ong pointed out, and this actually goes back to Milman Perry, 
he said that when Homer, when you read the Iliad, when you read uh, the Odyssey, Homer is using words that had become obsolete by that point. He's using words that, that were imported from other places or that were just simply not in use uh, where the Greek was being used. Why is that? Well, Perry would say these oral traditions have been carried on from, from, from far before or from far away places. And these distant lands or times when these, when these verses were first composed, the words are still there. And so you end up having a foreign vocabulary. You end up having words that aren't part of the language in the text because they're carried. These are the important parts of the, of the epics that could not uh, be changed. Well, you look at the Quran, Arthur Jeffrey has a book called The Foreign Vocabulary of the Quran. This is the same Arthur Jeffrey who had the materials. You can buy this book off Amazon, uh, The Foreign Vocabulary of the Quran. He found 316 words in the Quran that in some way, shape, or form were foreign to the Arabic of the time. And so where do these words come from? Again, it fits our theory of oral composition. These were imported from elsewhere. The word Quran itself is one of those words. It wasn't used in Arabic at the time. It was something that was imported from Syriac. Um, and we talked about that yesterday. Andrew Bannister, the same guy who points out the oral formulae in the Quran, also points out that there are different versions of the same story found in the Quran. So in the Quran, for example, you've got the story of Satan bowing, not bowing before Adam. So the story is that Allah told Satan to bow down before Adam. Satan did not bow down before Adam, and so he was cast out. Uh, he was rejected and he was accursed. This story is found seven times in the Quran. Well, each of the seven has some differences. They're not verbatim the same. Andrew Bannister says these are performance variants. In other words, or potentially at least, performance variants. When Muhammad was recounting these, he slightly changed it each time, which was normal for oral composition. It wasn't expected to be verbatim. No one cared about verbatim precision. Um, so essentially, Andrew Bannister's arguing this is the same story. It's not seven different versions of the same story. This is the same story, but it looks different through performance variants. That's something we would expect of oral composition. So internally then, we've got antagonism between people, you've got oral formulae, you've got paratactic arrangement of arguments and verses, you've got these suras, you've got performance variances, you've got foreign vocabulary. All these things point to and accumulate and build up the case for the fact that the Quran was originally an oral composition. But let's take a look at some of the historical features we talked about. First off, we know that the Quran itself was revealed orally, right? We remember that first revelation where the angel said, recite, and then he gave orally a statement to Muhammad. And then Muhammad will then orally share it with scribes. So we know orality is imbued in the dictation of the Quran. But there's actually a verse in the Quran that sheds a lot of interesting insight into the way the Quran was revealed. This verse is chapter 75, Surah Al-Qiyamah, verse 16 through 19. Allah is talking to Muhammad and he says, Stir not your tongue to hasten it therewith. Lo, upon us rests the putting together thereof and the reading thereof. And when we read it, follow thou the reading. Upon us rests the explanation thereof. Okay, what's going on here? Allah is saying, don't try to recite the Quran quickly so that you can remember it. All right, don't try to hurry up and recite it. After Gabriel says it to you, don't hurry up and recite it uh, in order to remember it. Upon us, upon Allah, upon me, lies the responsibility of making sure you will remember it. So I will make sure you remember this. And when we read it, just, so when we recite it, just recite it back to us. And we will make sure that you understand it. Let's stop and think about this for a second. In here, in this verse, apparently Muhammad's worried that he's going to forget portions of the Quran, right? And that's why he's reciting it back as quickly as he can. Allah says, don't worry, I'll make sure you remember it. Why does Allah not say, your scribes are writing it down, it's okay? <laughs> right, where is that? In fact, in the Quran, anywhere, does it say that you're supposed to write this down? No. Now there is something in the Quran 
that talks about writing. Um, I don't have it on hand, but I think it's uh, Surah 22, where Muhammad is telling people, if they have a business transaction, a loan, that's made, then someone should write down the terms of the loan. And the scribe should not hesitate to write it. They should not become weary of writing it, is what it says, whether the terms are small or long. And they're supposed to obtain witnesses. So there's supposed to be witnesses and there's supposed to be scribes. That's what the Quran says. And then later on, it says, if you have um, a loan that's made, or if you have a business transaction that's made um, that isn't a loan of the same nature, then you don't need the scribe, just the witnesses will suffice. Okay, so what does this tell us? This tells us that people could write, but it also tells us that people grew weary of writing, because it says don't grow weary of the writing, no matter how toilsome it is, no matter how long or short it is. So people grew weary of the writing, but if we're very careful, we will notice that what's more important than the writing? <coughs> the witnesses. The witnesses are more important. Because when you have to disperse with one, which one do you disperse with? Not the writing, the wit uh, not the witnesses, the writing. The witnesses are still necessary. Very interesting, and this makes sense. According to oral preliterate psychodynamics, it makes sense. All the same, why is it not written anywhere, especially in Surah 75, that you have this written down, that your scribes will write it down immediately. Make sure your scribes write it. It's not there. And what does that tell us? That makes a lot of sense of the Ahraf, does it not? When Muhammad would say, you can recite it whatever way you want, just don't substitute mercy for justice and just punishment and punishment for mercy. All of a sudden, this makes a lot more sense. Muhammad doesn't care about the verbatim words. He cares about the meaning, which is how people thought in preliterate days. Verbatim was not an issue. Even when people used to say in preliterate times, I remember word for word what such and such said. When they'd recite it, it wasn't word for word. It wasn't verbatim, and then you, you could point out to them, this isn't verbatim, but they wouldn't care. It's verbatim enough, basically. Um, and so, the Ahruf makes a lot more sense when you take a look at it, look, take a look at it in this oral uh, milieu. What else makes sense? The abrogation. Let's stop and think for a second. If you consider a book to be a written book, and Muhammad says, okay, this verse is no longer a part of the Quran, you would have the kinds of questions we had here. How could Muslims not have cognitive dissonance when they're striking out a section of the Quran. Doesn't that cause problems for the Muslims? Yeah, it would, if it were written. But if Muhammad were saying, hey, remember that verse that you used to recite? Stop reciting it. All of a sudden, you've abrogated a section of the Quran without ever having to take pen to paper. That verse is gone. And it's not as hard, it's not as cognitively dissonant as striking things out. So abrogation makes a lot more sense when you take a look at it in an oral milieu. What else makes sense? When is it that we get disputes showing up in the canon of the Quran? Remember Ibn Masud, 111 chapters. Ubay ibn Kaab, 116 chapters. When do these disputes start happening? When it was written. When people had to make a decision on what is part of the Quran and what's not part of the Quran. Up until then, if people just didn't recite Surah 114 and 113, the question wouldn't even come up, is this part of the Quran or not? It wouldn't matter. It, no, one, no one's thinking of, about that. But when it comes time to codify exactly what is part of the Quran and what's not part of the Quran, all of a sudden, it matters. Decisions have to be made. You have to stake your claim. So the fact that disputes happened exactly when they happened, in the manner they happened, when the Quran was being codified, that also points to the oral nature of the Quran. Okay, uh, I was wrong. It wasn't Surah 2, 22, it was Surah 2, verse 282. Surah 2, verses, verse 282 is where uh, you have this record of scribes writing things down. Um, so that could be an objection. Here you have scribes writing things down. Why wouldn't they write down the Quran? Well, I think it's because Muhammad didn't intend for the Quran to be a written book. 
By the way, we know Muhammad was illiterate according to the Quran. So Surah 17 of the Quran says that Muhammad was illiterate. Um, and so Muhammad's illiter illiteracy itself adds more weight to the fact that the Quran was an oral composition and it was intended for oral purposes. That's 2.17. Surah 17. There is one major objection to this, to this point of view, and that is that the Quran calls itself a book. It's called Al-Kitab, the book. But the response to that is actually fairly simple when you, when you take a look at it. According to even Muslim scholars, for example, uh, Taki Usmani, he's a jurist out of Pakistan, he argues that the term book did not simply mean written things, it also meant what was on people's hearts. And William Graham agrees to that. William Graham is the one I mentioned earlier who's, who started proposing this theory of an oral Quran. He agrees. He says that when Muhammad envisioned a book, what he was envisioning was things that were read aloud by the Jews and by the Christians. There were no Arabic books. So when the Jews and the Christians would read their book aloud, what were they doing? Were they actually reading a book? No, they were reciting portions of the New Testament. They were reciting portions of the Old Testament. And that's what Muhammad considered to be a book, these oral recitations. It's also interesting to note that there is a Muslim scholar named Manthar Sfar, S-F-A-R, who argues that today's Quran is corrupt because it was never meant to be the Quran. The Quran is the one in heaven. That is Al-Kitab, not the one here. And so Sfar goes through the Quran. Whenever the Quran says the book, the Quran is Al-Kitab, he says that Allah is talking about the book in heaven. He's not talking about the recitations here. What's here are recitations of the book. It goes even further, by the way. The, the term Quran, if you take a look at the Hadith, it wasn't really used as a proper noun, um, at least not uniformly. It was used as the word recitation. So it was said in one hadith, it is said, uh, recite whatever Quran you have with you in prayer. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't make sense if you see the Quran as a proper noun. But if you see the Quran as a lot of individual little recitations that you can recite in liturgy, each of which are recitations, the Arabic word for that being Qurans, then it begins to make sense. Recite whatever Quran you have with you. Only after time did the Quran we have, that we, the book that we have, get called the recitation, Al-Quran. Before that, all of the little liturgical recitations and they were all called Qurans. And that's another argument William Graham makes. So, this has not, by the way, made it into the realm of apologetics. I've never seen this argued um, anywhere. I actually thought I came up with a theory, and then I saw William Graham had written a whole book on it, and I was very upset. <laughs> um, so, anyhow, the, the implications for this theory are that to simply ask, I'm sorry, to simply state that the Quran has been perfectly preserved, every letter is exactly how it was written originally at Muhammad's time, is almost a category fallacy. It wasn't even intended to be a written book. Um, that's really problematic for the, the Islamic polemic uh, that the Quran has never been changed. But even more important is that it provides a model that makes a lot of sense of the data that you have. Now the question still remains, are the sources reliable? Were there such things as ahruf? Were there such things as abrogation early on? You know, remember, we, can't, we don't really know with certainty how trustworthy those sources are. So that question still remains. But if we are to accept the contours of those sources, then we must conclude that this model makes a lot of sense of that data. That the Quran was not envisioned to be a written book. The monumental contribution that Uthman made to the Quran was him turning it into a book. When he wrote it down, he radically changed the Quran, not just in the text that it had, but it's in its entire form and how it was understood by Muslims. Of course, apart from this, just looking at the data as it is, the, the whole claim that the Quran has never been changed exactly the way it always was is just untenable, historically speaking. 
It just does not fit the evidence. You have to throw out a ton of evidence in order to make that claim. I would like to point out, for the sake of clarification, that I would not argue the Quran has been radically altered. I wouldn't argue that. I would argue that we can't know how altered the Quran is. Uh, but we do know that there were early disputes. We do know that there's no reason to say it wasn't altered. Um, and we do have evidence that hundreds of verses are missing. Did that change the meaning of the Quran? Who knows? Who knows? But according to the sources, hundreds of verses are missing. We don't know exactly how altered the Quran is, and there is simply no basis to say it's exactly the way it was before. By the way, if any of you, um, I'm trying to decide whether I should do this. Um, after a little while, if any of you would like my uh, thesis, which is on this issue, uh, you can request it from me and I'll send it to you. Yes? I was just thinking, kind of like with those imams, you told the story of the imams telling you this, uh, like about the spirit of the Quran, and I was um, thinking if, if you make the case that it is oral and that it's kind of these, um, is never intended to be written down, so it could be imperfectly spoken, and that's how it was to be received with imperfectly in the sense that, you know, there may be certain parts missing. I take the, you know, um, when I'm retelling it myself in my performance, I change some certain things. Um, then, uh, is there, I, I get, I just, it seems like that they can say, then we still have the Quran today because we're still speaking it, you know, imperfectly. Uh, and it's just like, you know, representative of the real Quran that's in heaven. Do you, do you kind of get what I'm saying? Yeah, so the question was, um, if we argue that the Quran was meant as an oral text and not as a written text, then Muslims would be able to say, we still have the Quran today. I think that's correct. I think that's correct. Um, but we would also have to say, I mean, this, the issue of abrogation still remains. The issue of fluidity still remains. Um, and really, it takes away the whole apologetic impulse of the Quran has never been changed. Right. You'd, have, you'd have to say there was so much fluidity built into it that in that sense, yeah, it wasn't changed, um, but not textually, and you can't compare that to the Bible and the Old Testament then, which were written works. Right, and I think that wouldn't, it seems like they could, they, maybe they wouldn't want to, but if, uh, it seems like they could forfeit that to you, but still say the true Quran's never been changed, and you know, our retellings of it are fairly representative of it, and you know, uh, that's not enough for a Muslim, though. It's not, okay. That's not enough for a Muslim. They would want, they need the text to be exactly the same. Um, and uh, I want to clarify, when I say that the Quran was never intended to be written down, I mean by Muhammad, and I do think that people wrote stuff down at his time, but those were used to remind Muslims of the oral text. That wasn't the Quran itself. Those were reminders, which is pretty much the conclusion of scholarship. So I'm not denying that there were people writing things down at moments of time, but I am saying those weren't necessarily comprehensive. It, it doesn't mean that all of the Quran was written down um, and that those writings were not considered Quran. The actual recitation was considered Quran. Right. Amanda. The notion of the Quran having never been changed, is that why it's believed that the Quran is only true in the Quran when it's in Arabic and that if it's translated into other languages, you're not reading the true Quran? Is that where that comes from or does that come from something different? That partially comes, oh, the question was if you, uh, the notion that the Quran has never been changed, is that a derivative of the fact that um, it's only read in Arabic? I would say that Muslims think the Quran is so deep in its meaning and so infinite in its uh, implications that if we were to translate it away, we would lose meaning mm -hmm. and we would lose implication and therefore any translation is not true Quran. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that the original impetus, you're right, um, is that the Quran was intended for oral recitation amongst Arabs um, and so to recite it in a different language would lose some of its potency. Mm -hmm. But that's a very tenuous statement. I wouldn't stand by that um, if I had to. It's just a guess. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, sir. It was cited in different languages. I guess it had to be translated back into Quraysh. Was the idea of translation? They will say that the Quraysh was a dialect. It wasn't a different language. Oh, it was a dialect? Yeah. And that's probably accurate. Any other questions? Well, yes, ma'am. How many language, I mean, I know we have a Quran at home that is in English, but how many languages is the Quran translated into? Well, okay, so Muslims will not allow the term translation for Qurans, generally speaking. They will say an interpretation of the meaning. Um, so they want to make sure that you understand that this is not original Quran. The original Quran has to be in Arabic. Um, that's why most Qurans, if they're going to be accepted by Muslims, have to be two column, one column Arabic, one column English, or whatever other language. It wasn't until recent times when people endeavored to translate the Quran, um, and certain sects translate the Quran far more than other sects. The sect of Islam that my family comes from tries to translate it in tons of languages. Um, and uh, it's a very missionary oriented sect. Uh, other sects will say that you can't and you shouldn't. You should teach whoever wants to learn it Arabic and they would have to read it in Arabic. So I would say it's in a lot of languages. I don't know how many, but uh, it's in a lot of languages, but that's based on the efforts of a few. Yes, sir. Uh, I've read that one of the reasons that the uh, belief of illiteracy for the prophet is, is so important is because therefore he could not have uh, consulted sources for his content. But it looks pretty clear that the, that the content is anything but original. Um, he tells Bible stories, he tells Old Testament, New Testament stories, he tells some others, and I don't want to go into the list of four or five things because I could be a little wrong there. Uh, how does this discussion that we've just had about the oral nature of the original uh, Quran uh, account for the, the content? So, The illiteracy of Muhammad, the reason why, okay, um, you want me to repeat the question? <laughs> that was a long question. Um, give me the question one more time, I'll see if I can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've read that the Islamic world today will insist upon his illiteracy because he got it directly from God, he didn't consult, he didn't learn, his wife's priest who married him didn't teach him the scriptures uh, of the Christians and the Jews. Mm, mm -hmm, I see. Uh, and uh, at the same time, when you read the stories, they're the same stories that are in the Bibles of the Jews, and some of the other stories are in the books of the heretics or the uh, other Gnostics. Uh, where do you get the information if it was all oral? Because they're coming from written, unless we want to maintain that in his day, the people that could have communicated these things to him we're also memorizing it. Uh, okay, so the question then is um, the impetus for uh, the emphasis on Muhammad's illiteracy uh, is often for apologetic purposes, to say that Muhammad couldn't have gotten these stories from anywhere because he was illiterate. I've read that in two or three uh, of the things that I've been reading. So where did he get this from? Uh, I would like to point out that the Quran actually gives that reason itself. So I said chapter 17 earlier, I was wrong, it's chapter 7. Uh, verses 157 and 158, um, which says Muhammad was illiterate, and also chapter 29, verse 48, uh, which says Muhammad was illiterate. And in those verses, it says that you accuse him of having written this stuff himself, uh, but how could he? He's illiterate. He hasn't read anything like this, and he couldn't if he tried. Um, so that's found in the Quran itself. We need to remember that this society was starkly different from ours. You didn't have to read to get this information. You had to be able to hear, which virtually everyone did. So, uh, I mean, even it's the same thing in, in uh, first century Palestine, by the way, where the Gospels were written. They weren't sitting around reading the Gospels. 97% uh, of people in first century Palestine were illiterate. Only 3% were literate. Um, so to, 
to hear the Gospels, what would happen was you'd have someone who would sit down and he would read it aloud. In order to hear the Gospels, someone would uh, recite it aloud and others would hear it. It's the exact same thing for Muhammad. So if he's gonna hear these things, he could have heard them anywhere. Um, we know that there were Christians in his area. We know that there were Jews in his area. And we know that Muhammad was a merchant who traveled. And he went all kinds of places and heard, heard all kinds of stories. And he spent time with people from other places. So that Muhammad heard these things from elsewhere uh, is not difficult to account for at all. We'll talk about this a bit tomorrow when we talk about some of the apologetic implications. But there are verses in the Quran which talk about Jesus uh, that are from Gnostic sources. Uh, the Arabic infancy gospel, the infancy gospel of Thomas, etc. There, there's literally Muhammad, or the Quran says these things happened, but these are Gnostic sources. Um, where did he get them? Well, he heard the Gnostic sources. Did he read them? Probably not. 97% of people didn't. Um, they, 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 read, they heard them. It'd be interesting, actually, if you want to look um, in Acts, uh, what chapter? I don't know. Um, towards the beginning of Acts, um, you have the Ethiopian. Is he Ethiopian? He's traveling in a caravan. Oh, yeah. uh, is it Philip? <laughs> Philip who, um, who hears him. And uh, it says he overheard him reading Isaiah. I mean, are his eyes that loud? <laughs> you can <laughs> overhear him reading it? No, the way people read stuff was people read them aloud. It was read aloud to them. So I could say, hey, I was reading such and such. What I mean is someone was reading it aloud to me. Um, and we see that even in the New Testament. So Muhammad, having read this stuff, heard this stuff, you know, it's not hard to explain, especially considering his travels and the people he was hanging around. But is that indeed the Muslim claim about how he got the stuff? No, no, no. Okay, so how the Muslim, the, the Muslim claim on how he got this stuff is definitely, Muslims will say that Allah revealed it to him directly. Uh, they don't need to say that. I mean, it doesn't really add much to their case. Um, but uh, that's, what, that's what they'd argue. He got it directly. Did Muhammad, was he a religious man before this? Did, was he a Christian, a Jew, a pagan? What yeah, so the Islamic sources will say that Muhammad was a monotheist, and that's about it. He just believed in one God um, before his ministry. Not that it says anywhere. Uh, again, you've got people like Patricia Crona and Michael Cook who would argue that he was actually a heretical Christian. Um, but uh, the vast majority of scholars and all Muslims would say no, he was just a monotheist. Do you have any other questions? Yes, sir. Doesn't this fit in as well with uh, the role of poets, what that was supposed to have been in pre-Islamic Yeah, there is, um, so the question was, doesn't that kind of play in with the role of poets um, in early history? Um, and I wanted to read this for you. This is a classical Islamic commentator, Ibn Rashik, who says, when there appeared a poet in the family of the Arabs, so talking about Arabs right before Muhammad, when there appeared a poet in the family of the Arabs, the other tribes round about would gather to that family and wished them joy for their good luck. Feasts would be gotten ready. The women of the tribe would join together in bands, playing upon lutes as they were wont to do at bridals. And the men and boys would congratulate one another. For a poet was a defense to the honor of them all, a weapon to ward off insult from their good name, and a means for perpetuating the glorious deeds of establishing their fame forever. So poets were extremely important in this society. Uh, and again, oral society makes sense. Um, that Muhammad was a, just a poet was a common accusation. According to the Quran, if we, can, if we can read the Quran in a documentary fashion, which skeptical scholars would say we can't, but if we can, um, the Quran often responds to the claim that Muhammad is just a poet. Um, and that's part of the reason for the challenge. If you think he's just a poet, then you try to write something like this. You'll see that you can't. Um, that's how that all works together. Wasn't 
Wasn't there an account of an early poet in Mecca who had accused Muhammad of basically borrowing poetry and for, being a forger? Uh, again, that's, so that's in the Quran. It says, they accuse you of forgery. Um, but if they knew better, you know, essentially the Quran is saying. So yeah, it's, it seems so. Um, there's all kinds of stories of, uh, of poets battling with Muhammad uh, at that time. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was thinking about the, you know, the oral practice of you know, putting things side by side rather than the written uh, practice of going in deep. And so I was thinking about a lot of biblical texts, but especially in the book of Proverbs. You, know, that, you see that all the time. So I'm wondering, you know, just off the cuff, what would you say about comparing and contrasting you know, that phenomenon in the Quran uh, and the Bible? Actually, Genesis is given as a common example, Genesis 1, of an oral text. Because if you actually look at Genesis verbatim from the Hebrew, it'll say, and then God did this, and then God did this, and then God did this, and then God did this. And you see a lot of ands in there used as conjunctions, which is supposed to be a hallmark of oral composition. Um, the difference here is the Islamic claim versus the Christian claim. It doesn't pose a problem for Christian inspiration at all if it was an oral text later written down. Yeah, yeah. It does pose a problem for the Islamic polemic uh, that the Quran has never been changed. Um, so you're right, uh, when it comes to the literary quality of the Bible, there are certain portions of the Bible that seem to have been composed in, in oral composition, but it does not um, compromise the claims of inspiration and inerrancy for Christians, whereas it does for Muslims because Muslims have a higher view of, of their inspiration and inerrancy. That was a great point. Ma'am. I'm sure if I can word my question, but I'll try. <laughs> uh, your statement about the language and how um, the Quran, the recitations were for the Arab peoples, then what gives them the impetus to take their beliefs or the message of the Quran to other peoples? Well, I wouldn't say it was for the Arab people. So the question was, um, what gives them the impetus to take the message elsewhere when it was developed for the Arab people? I don't think that, well, first off, I don't think Muhammad thought it through that carefully. Um, I, I, I don't think he, he realized uh, what the implications would be, but at the same time, Muhammad did say uh, that you could read the words however you wanted to. He introduced an element of fluidity into the text. So he allowed for people to read however they needed to read in order for them to learn it. Um, plus, from the very beginning, you had Muhammad telling people to go and conquer others. I mean, this is in Surah 9. Uh, to go and, uh, unless they accept Islam, to fight them. Um, now, what does that mean? That means Islam was intended for evangelism, if you will, uh, for spreading along those lines uh, in its own remarkable way. Um, so I wouldn't say that it was intended just for Arab people, but I would say that it was crafted in the Arab language for uh, an Arabic milieu. So that's what I mean by I don't think he thought it through. I, it, it wasn't crafted in a universal way, but it was intended for people of all sorts. Any other questions? We have covered a lot today. We have looked at uh, a lot of the issues with critical scholarship. We've looked at a lot of the sources. This was a very heady day. Um, I gave you a lot of the names of scholars so you can do further research uh, on your own. Um, but this stuff is important to wrestle with because most people who engage in apologetics with Muslims haven't dealt with this stuff. Um, most believers who work with Muslims, they just don't know the complications when it comes to Muhammad's life, when it comes to the Quran, the level of disagreement even among scholars, uh, and the truly problematic nature of the sources. Now that you've wrestled with this and understood it, we're gonna go back to mainly a descriptive approach when we talk about apologetics, because again, that's the basis off which to build a bridge to discuss with Muslims. Um, so you've wrestled with this, you've grappled with it, keep it in your storehouse of knowledge, learn from it, um, but tomorrow, when we're talking about apologetics, when we're talking about discussions with Muslims, we need to work off of a common bridge. So we're going to be talking from a more or less descriptive approach.
Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.